morning. I forgot to get my Bible out. And we might need it. As you know, we introduced uh, our topic for the summer, evolution creationism, and it's actually two religions, two philosophies, two choices, two opinions, which is myth, which is truth. And we talked about dinosaurs and man coexisting. And we talked about the Ice Age. Was it ancient or recent? And we talked uh, last week about evil, uh, bad things. Where does bad things come from? Evil, hurt, suffering, things of that nature. And we talked about that. And today we're going to talk about race. And next week, the National Academy of Sciences. And... Uh, so this issue of bad things that we talked about was uh, death, disease, suffering. And the two opinions on it, of course, is that God created everything really good. He said it was very good. There was no disease. There was no death, no dying, no suffering, no tears, no sorrow, no weather, uh, not anything to be afraid of. Didn't have to ever, we've not had to worry about any children uh, having something wrong with them had we had children under the original conditions in the garden because there had been no such thing as bad things for a child. And, uh, of course, the secular view of uh, this is that uh, this came into being by random natural selection, you know, from evolution. It came from chaos, in other words... Uh, the earth started out in chaos. It was uh, a great big fireball and it was cooling down and it finally got a primordial ocean of boiling water and methane gases in the atmosphere and all kinds of things. And uh, so as a, as a result, uh, it was in chaos and then when life did evolve, it just uh, life, the living came from the non-living, which is absolutely impossible. And, uh, but when it did, it was survival of the fittest, and these one-cell survival of the fittest things due to much death, suffering, and all kinds of uh, competition, and killing one another, and eating one another, and destroying one another. Finally, we got up to where we are today, and man is the animal that's at the top of the heap because we have bludgeoned our way to the top. You've seen pictures before of the cavemen and their clubs and how they found out how to hit each other and, and to throw rocks first and then he hit it through the club and then they learned to throw things and then they invented bow and arrows and shot at each other and you know this whole evolutionary scheme like that. And so we've really evolved now to where we can use nuclear weapons and rockets and missiles and things of that nature and where else will we go? We'll go to laser beams and all kinds of things. You know we uh, We've demonstrated you can shoot an airplane down with a laser beam. That was demonstrated basically 25, 30 years ago. And then sort of they got a little silent about it now, see, that because they're starting to develop it as a, a technology that's usable, so it's no longer experimental, so you don't hear too much about it. But this is the evolutionary view, you know, that this came out of uh, chaos and all that kind of thing. And, of course, as we said, the Christian view was we were created very good. No death, no disease, no suffering, no meat eating, no dying, no sorrow, no anything of that nature. But then we get to, well then, if we really are created, did God create us in different races? And if he did, how did he do that? And what race was Adam and Eve from? And not only that, it, this thing has gotten so distorted that when he comes up to Noah, and the reason Noah had three sons on the ark is one was red, one was black, and one was white. And the one that was black was a bad guy, and therefore Ham and his descendants are, are the reason they're black is because uh, uh, they, Ham violated some rules of God, and God cursed him. Well, that's not even in the Bible. I don't know how that thing got started, but that's been an excuse for slavery and everything else, you know. There is a curse issue regarding Ham's family, but it's for the descendants of Canaan. And it doesn't have anything to do with them being black or anything of that nature. We're going to try to explain this. But uh, the Bible is all humans came from the first humans. And 
and the secular is that they evolved separately over many thousands of years. Now you think about that a moment. If, if Negroids and Coscoids, Mongoloids, if we evolved from different ancestors, then did we have a common ancestor at some point and evolved into three different kinds, or have we evolved from three different animal sources? Well, you know, uh, all evolutionists today, I don't care what kind of evolutionists are, none of them believe that the races evolved from different animals. They just, they can't bring themselves to that, even though that was first some first thought process, but not anymore. All evolutionists believe, all evolutionists, atheist evolutionists, believe that human beings evolved from a single source. Now, they believe they evolved human first, human-like, and then sort of subspecies. In other words, they become negroid, mongoloid, coscoid. Now they've added another, an asteroid, because of the, uh, the aborigines in Australia. And see, there's a lot of things they can't explain. They can't explain why the people from India, the country of India, who range from being brown to as black as you can be, they can't, they can't ex explain why that they're classified as Caucasians, although they're black. They're not Negroid. Well, you see, first place, there's no genes for race. There's genes for brown eyes. There's genes for, uh, uh, for uh, b brown hair, black hair. You say, well, what about blonde hair? What about blue eyes? Those are the recessive genes. We'll talk about that in a moment. But there's dominant genes and recessive genes. Now, there are genes... And genes are segments of DNA. We'll talk about that in a moment also. But you have, you have genes in your body that you got from your parents. You got one set of your chromosomes from your mother and one set of your chromosomes from your father. Well, in those chromosomes, there's also a chromosome from your father and a chromosome from your mother that tells your body how much melon to make. Now, melon is this pigment in our skin. This protein, now you either inherit to make a lot of this protein, to make quite a bit, to make just a medium amount, or less than a medium, or to make very little. Now looking around this room here, most of us in this room appear that we have inherited the genes from our parents to make very little melon. Now I got a little more because as y'all can see, uh, when I get out in the sun, I, I turn pretty brown. Now most of us at the start of spring, most of us are, are fairly white unless we've been underneath tanning lamps or something like that or been to Florida all winter or something. Most of us are pretty white. And, uh, but then if we were all really sunbathers and laid out on the lake all the time, at the end of the summer we would all not be the same shade of brown at the end of the summer. You've seen this. Some people just turn brown, brown, brown. Some people... They don't seem to be able to hardly tan at all. It doesn't matter how long you lay out in the sun. If you can't get a tan, you can't get a tan because you don't have the gene to make the protein to make the amount of melon for you to turn brown. And so people that are black, like the African people, they have tremendous amounts of melon. And so their skin is very, very dark. Now an albino is one that lacks uh, the ability to make this protein, this enzyme. In other words, that system is totally disrupted. And so they make no melon. Therefore, they have no skin color. They have no color. And it doesn't matter if you're Oriental or Negroid or Caucasian. All Mongoloids have the same skin color. Well, that should tell you something right there, that in the absence of this particular protein enzyme, in the absence of this, you, you, don't, you cannot make melon, therefore you have no skin color. And uh, we'll talk a little more about that. But uh, the secular view is, of course, that this, these evolved separately over many thousands of years. Well, you know, if it is true that races evolve, even though the uh, evolutionists agree that all the races of today came from one single source. They will agree with that. But they say that we evolved into Negroid, Mongoloid, and Coscoid over thousands of years. 
If that is true, you see, notice they use the term thousands of years, not millions and billions. Well, if that's true, if race is on the fast track, that means we should be seeing evolution in the so-called races today. We should still see evolution taking place within the Coscoid, Mongoloid, Negroid, and one should be out evolving the other. And so, you know, this becomes very racist and prejudicial because this is exactly the view of the Nazis and the Ku Klux Klan and the Black Panthers and the skinheads and all these radical racist supreme, supremacist groups. They, they are real believers in the evolution of race. And uh, they feel that the, that the blacks evolved recently from monkeys and they're not as advanced as us supremacist whites. That's what they believe. And they're taught that as children in their homes. And they come up with this hate of the blacks because the blacks are inferior. They've not evolved. They are ignorant. They won't work. You know, you put all these labels on them. And see, you, the only way a label becomes effective is if you've got the power to make the label stick. Now you see, the whites in the South here in our country had the power to make the label stick because of the subjug subjugation of the blacks as slaves. They had the power over them to make the label stick. And then if you practice discrimination even after you do away with slavery, if you discriminate, you can still make the label stick. And But uh, when you start looking at the genes, you look at genetics, you look at chromosomes, you look at the Bible, you cannot find any of this. It is absolutely wrong to believe in race. There is no such thing as race. And uh, I noticed that, uh, that even though our government's trying to be politically correct, and they don't even want to touch on the evolution of races, even though our government basically supports evolution and supports evolution, they don't want to get involved in the evolution of race. In fact, you're not even supposed to discuss such a foolish thing as there might be somebody superior to somebody else because we're all supposed to be equal and that's what all the laws are made now is to try to equal everybody out. And the problem with equalization laws is it usually pulls those that are up here down to this lower level rather than elevating the lower level up. You know, and you can't solve problems of prejudice and race and racial things. You can't solve problems like that and poverty that comes from it and the chaos, you can't solve it with throwing money at it. That's an impossibility. You cannot solve that problem with money. You must solve that problem with a heart. It must be solved with a heart. And our government says, oh, nope, 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 nope. You're going to solve it with a heart. You're religious. You're, you're getting church and state together, see. And yet they can still teach us evolution in the schools, which is a religion. And that's what the question was about uh, that we got last week was how in the world can we teach evolution in the school when it's a religion and cannot teach uh, a, a world a Bible view? Well, the reason for it is because the National Academy of Sciences and the evolutionists and the universities all are controlled by evolutionists. And though they have the predominant uh, uh, input in making the rules and the laws. And that's what's going on right now. It's even the Ten Commandments movement. It's doomed to failure unless God intervenes. And I'm not trying to discourage you or anything, but the whole United States government and all of its attorneys and everything is behind the evolutionists. Not only that, if the American Civil Liberties Union sues the local school board and the local school board loses, the local school board has to pay the ACLU's legal expenses. So uh, they're a large national, international organization and we got three counties here trying to fight them in Kentucky. So what we really need to do is have God's help and prayer. And uh, we, we cannot beat them by them making all the rules. And us playing according to their rules. Now if we pray about it intensely, we're not playing according to their rules. Then maybe we might win. See? With prayer and faith and that type of thing. But that the question involves a philosophy. In other words... It, it's really a philosophical question. How come there's this unfairness? That's, that's what the question really was asking. Well, that's the way, if you will recall, down in what's called the Scopes Monkey Trial down in South Tennessee next to Chattanooga, 
That's what was involved down there. They were teaching creationism in the public schools. They were teaching there is a God and God created the earth and all that and created it in six days. They were actually taught that in the public schools. Well, this science teacher, he was one of the, one of the upcoming evolutionists and he wanted to teach evolution. And of course it was against the law to teach evolution. So they sued in the courts uh, to be able to do that. And the way they sued in the court was they didn't actually bring a lawsuit. They broke the law so that uh, this science teacher would be charged with breaking the law and then the ACLU came in to defend him. And unfortunately for the Christians, they hired Clarence Darrell. I think, no, Jennings Bryant. Clarence Darrell was the ACLU. Uh, they brought in uh, Jennings Bryant and he couldn't answer questions, basic questions about the Bible. When they asked him about creation, they asked him where did uh, Cain get his wife, they asked him about the flood, they asked him about all kinds of things. He couldn't answer them. He was made to look totally foolish on the witness stand. And so as a result, the end result of that trial was that they, they found the teacher guilty of breaking the law, I think, and fined him a dollar. But then it turned around and opened the court system up to this question and evolution was able now to be taught in the school on the basis of fairness. They, they, the contention was it was unfair to teach one view in the public school system. Now, that, that's what amazes me, is that after these years now, we've turned it totally around where there's one view being taught in the school system that is evolution, and they think that's fair. But they thought it was unfair when uh, Christianism was taught in the school as one view. Either you teach all the views and give your teachers real academic freedom, you know, without them being communist or fascist or politically motivated, but teachers must be given freedom, academic freedom, to teach for the purposes of teaching, but not to indoctrinate or, or to uh, espouse their propaganda. Well, the evolutionists now are espousing their propaganda through the school system. And so it just flipped over, it is unfair, and there's not much we can do about it right now. You know, until our hearts change, until we really get serious about teaching our children at home and in the church, until we make it a major emphasis to teach the Creator, Sovereign God to our children, how in the world are we going to send them to Sunday school for one hour a week and counter what they're getting 40 to 60 hours a week of continuously, 12 months a year, in the secular uh, community. You would be surprised how much your children are being subjected to evolution in the secular society. Just like what Ray read out of the book. Even here, it's our state parks, our official, our official issue for our state parks, publication by our state, has evolution all through it. Natural Bridge, Carter Caves, you go to Mammoth Caves, you go anywhere. You go to Cumberland Gap, you go to any kind of naturalist spot in Kentucky, and if there's a brochure on it, within the first paragraph, it will make some statement about millions and millions of years ago. I showed you those little children's book on dinosaurs and ants. First thing they said, millions and millions of years ago. It's, it's just totally been saturated in the, uh, in the, the books, in VHS tapes, television, movies, all of the Star Trek, Star Wars, Babylon 5, uh, all these things, science fiction. I like science fiction just because it's fiction, see? But science fiction is so embedded in evolution, it's pitiful. I mean, you look at the, what was that Star Trek series, the movies they made, and Spock was dead, but Spock some way or another got resurrected and went to Narbonne or somewhere, you know, and he was like becoming a god. And, well, that's Mormon religion. And uh, so anyway, uh, three major events have occurred that has to do with this thing of race. If, you know, was to show the lack of race and to really explain what it is. First is the fall of man. Genesis chapter 3. And when man fell, man was redesigned. He was now designed to die. And the earth was redesigned in that the earth would no longer just, just sit there. And if you pulled an apple off of a tree, another apple would just appear. 
No apples rotted, no apples fell off the tree, there was no leaves that fell off the tree, the grass didn't grow too high and need to be cut, or anything of that nature. Everything was in perfect balance. There, there was no need uh, to cut or prune or to trim or to take care of insects or, or you know, anything like that. There was no thistles, no thorns, no uh, poison ivy, no insects that would bite you and hurt you, no disease being transmitted. All that was redesigned. In other words, mankind was redesigned, animals were redesigned to die, and plants were redesigned. Well, things went on pretty good that way for a thousand or so years. And man becomes so corrupt. Now, I don't know what all man did to become corrupt, but it is documented in the Bible that he started becoming polygamous, and they started killing one another. And I don't know if they started killing animals or not and eating them. I don't know, because it was not authorized until after the flood. There was to be no meat eating whatsoever. And so the next major point here was the worldwide flood. And after the worldwide flood, the whole earth was now changed because there was tremendous chaos. The earth was torn all to pieces. And no one could have survived more than one or two days after that catastrophe started. It just tore the earth all to pieces. And what we see around us today is a post-flood, post-ice age uh, condition. Now, as we know, after the flood is when the ice age came because only by having lots of warm water and cold land can you get enough convection of air currents and condensation of the, uh, the water vapor in the air at a temperature to fall out as snow and ice to pack in so tight as to become ice and to become ice thousands of feet thick and spread out over thousands of miles. So tremendous amount of the flood water was locked up in ice caps after the flood. Tremendous amounts of the flood water ran down into low areas that collapsed when the water ran out from underneath the ground and left these empty caverns like Mammoth Cave and places like that and Carlsbad Caverns. The weight of the water broke a lot of them down and it formed these large basins we call the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Mediterranean Sea, the Black Sea and all these places. We also talked about how when the ice started melting because of the the establishment of climatic conditions like God established in Genesis chapter 9 and the ice started melting back, the ocean water started coming up. But that was after the Tower of Babel because people and animals had already spread everywhere because all the land was connected together. It didn't have to break apart and drift apart. It was connected. All land today is connected. You can walk on land from North Carolina to Africa if you want to. You just better be able to breathe water. But you can walk on land, you can go right out from the beach and walk right on land if you have something to hold you down. You can walk right on land, keep right on going, eventually cross the Atlantic on land. You know, the ocean's not a bottomless pit. There's land at the bottom of it. And all land is connected together. And uh, we've got water, and it separates us. Used to, I'm sure people used to walk across what's now Laurel Lake. You know, they go down one little hillside and jump across a creek and climb up the other hillside. You can't do it now. They put a dam up, the water's up, very deep. You can't walk from one side of the lake to the other side of the lake like you used to did when you just walked around and jumped across the creek. Same thing with the oceans. Before the flood, that's all connected together. There was only four rivers on earth before the flood and some lakes. And after the flood, all this water came from below and water from above. We've got all the ice caps, we've got the weight, we've got the collapse, the water ran off. In fact, the scripture says the water ran off into the places God prepared for them. It says in the book of uh, Jonah, got to get those guys separate. Jonah, that when he sunk down to the bottom of the sea, he was at the base of the mountains. He was at the base of the mountains. We talked about how the water spilled over when it melted into, the ice caps melted and the water spilled over into the Mediterranean basin and filled it up. And today we call it the Mediterranean Sea how it kept building up and went through the Dardanelles between Greece and Turkey and went up there and spilled over another waterfall and filled up what's called the Black Sea today. That was a nice valley with a freshwater lake. And that's even documented and uh, we, it's in records. And didn't happen too long ago. And uh, a lot of these things that's been attributed to millions and millions of years ago have happened recently. And we'll talk about them, especially when we get to the Mount St. Helens presentation. 
And uh, we'll look forward to that. Well, the fall of man set up death, a changed world, redesigned. Worldwide flood, total change of rules. Now meat eating, climates, and things of that nature. Now you think about this a minute. All people on earth, if you literally believe the Bible, all people on earth descended from Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives. We have no record that, uh, that Noah and his wife had any more children uh, after the flood. Now that's not to say they didn't. I don't know, but we have nothing to tell us that. We have no record or anything of it. But we do have records of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. They're three different lines. Now in the Bible, the Bible does not give complete genealogies. What it'll do, it dealt with Japheth and Ham only sufficient for the information we needed. And it deals with Ham a lot more than it does Japheth because Ham's descendants figure prominently in the history of Israel. The Canaanites, the Philistines, you know, the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, they figure prominently in the history of Israel. And Israel coming from the Shemites. So Shem has the most developed genealogy because that's the one Jesus Christ is going to come from eventually. And then the other most developed is Ham because of the relationship with Shem. Japheth is the least developed. Once it says uh, they went up toward the Black Sea and settled around the western side of the Black Sea and the north side, that's it. You don't have very little more from them. And of course that's where most of us in this room probably have descended from is probably Japheth, most of us. Because most of us can trace our roots back into Europe. And Europe, we're called the Caucasians. We're called the Whites. And uh, so uh, that doesn't mean Japheth was white. Shem, Ham, and Japheth probably were all the same color. The same color as their parents, mother and father. And they probably most likely, as best as we can tell genetically and everything, were probably brown. They probably had uh, brown or dark colored hair. They probably had brown eyes. And uh, we don't know, but uh, all these genetic things, uh, these are not, blue eyes are not uh, weak and brown eyes are powerful. In other words, not a thing of positive and negative. It's a thing of do you have a dominant gene, two dominant genes, you are uh, what we call homozygous dominant. In other words, it means you have two of the same dominant. If you have one gene for brown eyes and one gene for blue eyes, you will have brown eyes. But you are a carrier for blue eyes. If your wife has one brown gene and one blue gene, she's got brown eyes. So you two people with brown eyes, you're each carrying a recessive gene for blue, you can have blue-eyed children. You both can have black hair. But you have one gene for black hair each and one gene for blonde hair each. You can have children that are blue-eyed and blonde. And you're, you know, you're brown, brown-eyed and black hair. You know, because that's the way it works. So that's the way it is about skin color. It's in the genes. It's how much, uh, how does your gene say? Does the gene say make lots of melon? Or say make medium amounts of melon? Make small amounts of melon? Or sometimes don't make melon? Now that's considered to be basically an abnormal trait there. But as far as the others, they're all normal. You know, blue eyes and brown eyes are both normal. Black skin and white skin are both normal. See, they're both normal. Blue eyes and brown eyes, both normal. To have uh, uh, lots of uh, hair is normal and to have less hair is normal. It's according to what you inherit relative to pattern baldness or have you inherited true baldness. See, men get true baldness where they lose all their hair from their mother, not their father. And she got it from her father. And the reason women who inherit uh, two small bees, baldness, for baldness don't get bald is because women also have ovaries that put out estrogen. And as long as you have estrogen in your body, you'll not lose your hair. So that's the reason why women, when they, they stop making as much estrogen when they get in their 50s and 60s, their hair starts thinning out. See, it's all in the genetics, the genes. And, uh, you know, men, we could prevent me losing hair. All you had done is injected me with estrogen. 
but the other side effects would not have been so desirable. I'd rather have a loss of hair, you know. I don't think I want my voice real high, <laughs> you know. And all those other things that goes around with being feminine body characteristics. I'm perfectly satisfied with my masculine body characteristics because I have an X and a Y chromosome. And I don't want to look and act like a double X chromosome. That's called a female. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Well, after this flood, what did God say? God says, I want you to have lots of children and I want them all to move out and settle the earth. Now, God had the earth that's still all connected together with land so they could resettle the whole earth. And God knew that this ice cap was going to start melting, water's going to cut them off. God knows all that. And so he was going, he wanted them to move, and they didn't move. They stayed in the Babylonian Valley. They started building their own counterfeit worship system, and we refer to it as the Tower of Babel. They were not physically trying to get into heaven. They knew better than to try to build a tower they could climb up and then step off into heaven. What they were trying to do, they were establishing a religion. Because what did they say? Let us stay right here. God told us to move throughout the earth. We're not going to do it. Let us stay right here and make a name for ourselves. You read that? You read that, you read that story again. They were going to make a name for themselves. They were establishing a religion. This building was their temple. They were going to wind up probably having priests in this temple. They were going to have worship services. And they were going to have establish this counterfeit worship system right off the bat, see? And work their way into heaven. And God said, that's not according to my plan. And he confused their language. And now they had to spread out. They had to go and find people that spoke the same language they did, move off together, and that's what they did. Meantime, the ice caps are melting, the water's coming up, and they got cut off. Now, remember, that group that separated went over here. They had within them a set amount of genes on their chromosomes. And uh, when they got into these different areas and the weather changes settle down, now climatic conditions are going to favor such things. Let me give you an idea. If you are very dark skinned, you have less chances of getting skin cancer. If you are very light skinned, you have increased your chances of getting skin cancer. If you are dark skinned, you cannot absorb uh, sufficient vitamin D. You know, if you have a decrease in sunlight, if you're in an area where there's not very much sunlight, like way up north where it's dark three, four months a year, if you're real dark skinned, you, in the time of the year when it is light, the short daylight hours, you can't absorb enough daylight, there's enough sunlight through your skin to build enough vitamin D to stay healthy. You'll get rickets. And so certain climates favor certain genes and chromosomes. So when these people moved out from the Tower of Babel, they're all probably the same color. But then when they moved up into the north, and what happens up there, the ones that had this, uh, this uh, genetics to make less and less melon, and they had a lighter and lighter colored skin, those become favored, and the others over the several hundreds or several or a thousand years or so, they would have started dying from skin cancer. And, uh, I mean, dying from rickets if, they, if they're... Uh, let me get straight now. If they were light-skinned, they would be favored in the north. If they were up there real dark-skinned and they were making a lot of melon, then they would not be able to develop the vitamin D and they would have uh, died of rickets and different diseases like that. Now let's say some of them went down toward the equator to settle. And in that gene pool, they had the gene pool for lots of melon and less melon. Those that had lots of melon would have developed very dark skin, just like they had in their system to do and they would have not have developed a skin cancer and they would have been able to survive next to the equator. Whereas those that went down there that had the melon uh, for uh, light colored skin, then being in the tropical area, they'd had a lot of skin cancer and they would have died out. They would have not have married and had as many children and slowly over the years, then it would have favored the blacks. That's the reason why, you know, the equator goes through India. And in India, you have people that are as black as the people in Africa. But they call them Caucasians, you know. And uh, they're Negro in Africa, but they're Caucasians in India, and they're the same color. And uh, so geneticists, uh, evolutionary geneticists, have a little problem with trying to explain that one. Uh, but uh, they have all the Caucasian characteristics, supposedly evolutionary-wise, but they're black-black. And they say, what's well, because they live on the equator? 
Well, maybe it's the blacks in Africa. Maybe they're black because they live on the equator, you know? I mean, you, you can't make the rules over here one way and then the rules over here another way. You can't evolve blackness over here by them evolving from animals. And you can't have Caucasians black over here because they live on the equator. I mean, you can't have two sets of rules. I mean, the equator and the heat and all that's going to have the same influence either way it goes. Well, so you can see how confusion of the language. God spread us out and we got separated into groups that had certain genes on certain chromosomes for certain conditions and then according to the climatic conditions certain uh, ones are favored and of course that's the kind of thing it's going to be a done away with eventually well race actually there's one human race you know Acts 17 26 just totally sets it straight a lot of times you know there's scripture uh, in the Bible and we uh, we don't know about it, or if we do, we've read it one time. We said, yeah, I read that, I read that once. And we think that we have um, solved it because we read it once. You know, it's like uh, going somewhere and you're going to become their teacher. And you say, well, what, what, would, you, uh, what would you like to have taught? You know, start speculating. Most of the time they ask for revelation, but I refuse to teach revelation. And I'm not worried about those kind of things. That's out in the future. I'm just worried about today. But anyway... Uh, uh, they want to teach Revelation, but you ask what they want to teach, and they'll suspect where you're in, and you say, well, let's study such and such a book. And they'll say, oh, we've already studied that one. Or uh, I say, well, why don't we do it? Why don't we study through the Bible? Well, we've already read the Bible once. Everybody here has already read the whole Bible all the way through. Why don't we study one of Charles Swindoll's books, or Charles Stanley's books, or, uh, you know, study somebody's book. And uh, when you study somebody's book, you're studying somebody's opinion about the book. And I just soon to study the book here, you know. And those are good men, incidentally. I like them every one. Study them, read, and all that. But I, I don't teach their books. I just don't teach their books. That's me personally. Well, what was that? Acts 17, 26. Actually, to really get a feel for this, you start back at verse 22, but I'll let you all read that later. And there's uh, ten things from Acts... Uh, Acts 17, 22 through 34, there are ten things that Paul is telling these people in Athens, Athena, uh, at Mars Hill when he comes up about this unknown God thing. But listen, listen to this one verse here, this verse 26. This is the third thing of the ten. This third thing says, and, and, and half made, and it's talking about God. And God, I'm, I put the word God in there, and God, my word, hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. I mean, right there it is. God has made all people groups of one blood. One blood. In other words, uh, we're all one people. One people group. We're not races. We didn't evolve separately. We're not evolving now separately or anything of that nature. And so uh, the uh, race, well, the evolutionary says, Caucasians, Mongoloids, Mongoloids, Negroid, Australo Austro Australoids from Australia. That's the, uh, the Aborigines down there. And so either one way or the other, you can't have them both together. It has to be one or the other. Well, let's talk about DNA for a minute. DNA. This is where it's at. You're hearing a lot about it nowadays. Everybody in here has 46 chromosomes. Now, there may be somebody that might have a 47th chromosome, but it's not number 47. It'll be three of a particular chromosome because of uh, division back inside uh, your mom or or even when she's making the egg or, or else after it got fertilized and incomplete division of some of the cells or some of that nature. But basically it goes back to the ovaries or the testes to get these kind of things. And most of them are fatal, but people can live with some little variations. But there's 46 chromosomes. You got 23 from each parent. What you did was from your father, you got one number one chromosome, one number two chromosome, one number three chromosome, one number four chromosome, right on through, one number 21, and one number 22. And number 23 is either an X or a Y. They don't give it a number, it's either X or Y. Men have uh, cells that are X cells or Y cells in their sperm. 
X cell or Y cell? If your X cell fertilizes your wife's X egg, you will have a daughter. If your Y cell fertilizes your wife's X cell, you will have a, uh, what did I say, son, okay. So in other words, the man determines the sex of the child. The man gives either an X or a Y. Women, mothers, have one number one, one number two, one number three, one number four, it's just exactly the same all the way through here to get the number 22. But women can only give an X. She has XX. I didn't bother to write the other X in there. But she only has XX, and every time she makes an egg, the egg will either have an X in it or an X in it. When a man makes a sperm, it'll either have an X or it'll have a Y. Now, if you have a son, he's got two number ones, where do you get them? One from his father, one from his mother. One right there, one right there, he's got two. Number two, he got uh, number two from his father, number two from his mother, he's got two twos, two threes, two fours, two fives, two six, two twenty twos. If he's a son, he got an X from his mother, he got a Y from his father. If this is a daughter, she has exactly the same thing as a son has. Two number ones, two number twos, two number threes, two number fours. Now remember though, a father has two number ones and his sperm can be one of the ones or the other ones. The mother has two ones and so an egg can either be one one she received from her father or one one she received from her mother. So there's four different ways to go here when you get down to it. And anyway, you wind up with giving a daughter two ones, two twos, two threes, two fours, two fives, two sixes, two twenty twos. And the father gave her an X and the mother gave her an X. Therefore, she's a daughter. Now, on these chromosomes, on these twenty two chromosomes here, on one of them, and I've forgotten which one, is the gene for making melon. In other words, you get it from your father and your mother. And uh, so, how, what kind of the gene that you get tells how much of that uh, melon that you will make. Well, the gene, what is a gene? A gene is a piece of DNA. Let's say the DNA was that long. Gene would be like this, a little segment. And this gene here, would we'd call it big B for brown hair, or little B for blonde hair. And you get a big B here from your father, and a little B from your mother, you'll have brown hair. You get a big B from your father and a big B from your mother, you have brown hair and that's all you can pass on to your children. Because both of yours are this. But if you're a big B and a little B, you could pass on to your children a big B or a little B. But if you have two little Bs, because your mother gave you a little B and your father gave you a little B, now there's not little Bs running around in there, it's segments, DNA. Segments of base groups, cytosine, guanine, adenine, thymine, things like that. But anyway, you got these little segments here, see? And if you got a little B from your mother and a little B from your father, you've got two chromosomes or two little Bs. Now you will be blonde-headed because you're carrying two recessive genes. That don't mean you're abnormal. You're just carrying two recessive genes. That's all. Same thing with eye color. Same thing with this melon. If you inherit, um, this, one's, uh, this one's designated as M. Capital M with a capital A and a capital B with a capital M with a capital B, then what you are, you're, you're, you've got the gene for making lots of melon. If you marry a woman that's got those two M's there, big M's, with big A and big B, little capital A and little capital B subscripts on them, then you're going to have a child that's going to be black, black, black. I mean, they're going to be black as black you've ever seen. But if you have a little M with a capital A, a little M with a capital B for the father, and a little M with a capital A, and a little M with a capital B for the mother, you're going to have a child that is so white that you'll be checking its eyes to make sure you didn't give birth to an albino. You see if there's some color in its eyes, you know. And uh, so it'd be very, very light. Now you can have any mixture in between. You have 16 different shades. You can take a, um, a black person that's all black, a white person that's all white, that's carrying no other genes, and mix them, they marry and have children, and their children will be mulattoes. You take a mulatta and marry a mulatta, and here you have two people that have, uh, say, dark brown skin. And they can give, if they had 16 children and all the genes lined up just right, they could have 16 different shades of children. They could have a black, 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 and a white, 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 and every shade between, 14 other shades in between. 
And that's because it's in the genes. It's not in her, it's not in evolution, it's not in race. Blacks and whites and mongoloids and reds and American Indians, natives, Eskimos, everybody has the same system. Same system. And it's just that we got isolated in pockets after the flood, after the dispersal by confusion of languages, and after the melting of the ice caps, we got isolated, and due to climatic conditions which were caused as a result of the flood, God established climate after that, it favored certain uh, people that were carrying certain genes. That's just consequences of the fall, the flood, and the uh, confusion of languages. You see, God didn't curse anybody. There's just consequences that came out of all this. Okay. Well, there it is right there. In other words, you get a certain amount of melon, and the melon can either make lots, I mean, a certain gene uh, to make certain enzymes and proteins to make melon, and you can either make lots of melon, less melon, minimum melon, or you may have a defect and you can't make any at all. And this is where you get your range of skin color. Skin color has not anything at all to do with intelligence, workability, integrity, being human, uh, has not anything at all to be with that. Well, what happened? Well, God created us in one skin color. The flood led to climatic condition changes and ultraviolet radiation. We have environmental influences we talked about. We got the confusion of languages. We got dispersed and there was rise of people groups because of the isolation of genes and the favoring of certain people with certain genes. And uh, we'll start in on these things next week. And right here is just a little picture of the earth. And the earth's over 23 and a half degrees on its axis, have a north pole and a south pole. These polar areas as you approach them favors light-skinned people. The closer you come to the equator favors dark-skinned people because of cancer and because of rickets and the absorption of vitamin, uh, manufacture of vitamin D in your skin and things of that nature. Well, Neanderthals, were they cavemen, missing links? No, they were people that were probably dark-skinned that got too far north and all their bone structure gives evidence of rickets, bone problems all through their body. They've now been classified as homo sapiens, Neanderthal. But you know, still yet, I see programs where they're calling Neanderthals cavemen. Well, right here. We're not going to shortchange this. We're going to start back with this here next week. Um, consequences. What are the consequences of accepting race as evolutionary? You reject the accuracy of the historical Genesis account, and you develop a racism as a belief that people, groups, evolve separately, and some are superior to others. It also has a direct effect on your mission's endeavor because there's actually people that says, why should we worry about people in the jungles and other places? They're only half evolved and they're still basically animals. And why should we waste uh, missions, uh, money, and people on that? And you also get distorted views from biblical accounts such as the curse on Ham is what turned them black and all blacks are cursed. That type of thing. Well, right there is where we'll start. Let me throw this one other up here. And we will start back on um, these last three next week. Right here is one that's very important. The results is a loss of technology, thinking racist, and cultural degeneration. We want to really look at Romans 1. Because Romans 1 talks about what happens when man starts thinking evolutionary and quits thinking about a creator God. Let's start right there next week.